Hey guys, it's History Behind the Warrior. Welcome back to yet another Mortal Kombat History of video. Now in today's breakdown and analysis, I will be talking about a beloved icon of the 3D era, the Cleric of Chaos, Havoc. Havoc is one of the more obscure characters in the series. So in order to touch on him, I must first cover where he originates from and the Chaos Realm itself, as it is a somewhat character and does heavily influence Havoc as well as other Chaos Realmers. Now at the dawn of time, there were two different primordial gods. The first being the Elder Gods, and the second being known as the One Being. These two deities would clash head to head at the dawn of time, with the monstrous One Being claiming victory. And whilst the Elder Gods were on the back foot, they did formulate a plan by creating Kamidogu amulets that would separate the One Being's physical body. By doing so, it left him in fragments, but these fragments would eventually grow into the realms as we know it, and they in turn would bring forth life. But the Chaos Realm didn't start off in the way it's known for. You see, once the gods saw life flourish, they would assign a different god to each realm, with apparently a god of chaos taking domain and control of the chaos realm, or yet to be chaos realm. Upon entering its domain, the god of chaos would unleash a catastrophic blast that would send ripples and crackles throughout the entire realm, leaving it in mere fragments. This would be known by the chaos realmers as the Tempest, and upon the realm's somewhat destruction, it would not only splinter it, but the events of the Tempest would give birth to the chaos realm itself, its religion, and how all inhabitants there existed. So the Chaos Realm wasn't always a splintered wasteland. It honestly had a lot of potential to turn out much like Earthrealm, but it goes to show what one simple god can do in order to alter what can be. Now from the ruins of the Tempest came forth the Chaos Realmers, individuals twisted and contorted from the destruction. And it seems like the influence from the realm itself was starting to infect and alter the mindset of individuals there, as they were able to physically rip and tear their limbs with no repercussion. Their Chaos transcended the realm of mortality. So in a sense, they are kind of immortal. And because of their spontaneous and insane nature, it did in fact put them in the crosshairs of an orphanitarian government slash realm, the Order Realm. Believing that order is absolute and that they needed to control this insanity, the two realms would be locked in combat for an eternity, simply by the beliefs and their way of life. They detested each other. Now this brings us up to Havoc's debut in Mortal Kombat Deception. Now canonically, Havoc makes his first appearance in the conquest mode of the game, where he meets the game's protagonist Shijenko, and offers to aid him in his quest, as he's been granted a mission from the gods to obtain Kami Dogus of each different realm. So upon entering the Chaos Realm, he would strike a deal with the man, but of course this would be at a cost. You see, as Shijenko was getting on with his quest, the Chaos Realm was being invaded by the Order Realm, wishing to take their water from them, which is in fact something the Chaos Realmers do hold in high regard. You see, water in the Chaos Realm is in fact worshipped by its inhabitants. Since it is shapeless and cannot be controlled, it is in fact seen by them as a somewhat god, so they do worship water because of its somewhat chaotic nature. Now with some assistance by Shijenko, they are able to push back the Order Realm forces, and with their victory being a success, he would help Shijenko in obtaining the Kami Dogu of the Chaos Realm. Now with this job complete, the two would part ways, but this wasn't quite the end of habit. Between Shijenko's departure of the Chaos Realm and the end of Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, the Dragon King Onaga returned, using Shijenko as a pawn to obtain the Kami Dogus of each realm. So by the end of Deadly Alliance, where the Dragon King makes his presence known, Havoc would set out to stop him, but not without his own agenda in mind. You see, being well aware of the Dragon King's resurrective capability, Havoc believed that by killing the Dragon King and consuming his heart, then he would obtain the very same power. So he would set out from the Chaos Realm to Outworld, but on his journey, he would come across an injured former Earthrealm defender, that being Cabal, bloody and beaten from a skirmish with the Red Dragon fighter Movado. He was at death's doorstep, but realising the opportunity that presented itself before him, Havoc would nurse him back to health, so he could slowly but surely corrupt the man and get the idea in his mind to reform the Black Dragon organisation, something that fell apart a long time ago. At this point, it didn't really take much convincing, and during the events of Deception, Cabal would reform the Black Dragon clan and would recruit two new individuals, that being Kira and Cobra. Now Havoc, sensing that the end was near, would set out during Shijenko's sea after the Dragon King had revealed his betrayal. Believing that victory was in his grasp, Havoc wanted to storm the temple and take the opportunity to consume Onaga's heart. But he had underestimated the forces that Shijenko had brought with him, having the likes of Ermac, Nightwolf and even the spirit of Liu Kang at his side. Havoc decided to bind his time. He may be insane, but he is absolutely no 
fool when he knows that he's outnumbered. So Havoc would lie in the darkness, waiting for the opportunity to strike when it benefited him the most. Mortal Kombat Armageddon. Now in Armageddon, Havoc doesn't really actually play a big role in the game. He himself makes a very brief somewhat cameo in the conquest mode of the game, which is focused on the two brothers, Taven and Dagon. He would come across the fallen elder god Shinnok, who'd want to test his capability by having him fight illusions of fighters across the realms, with one of them being the Chaos Cleric. Now his final canonical appearance in the original timeline is during the Battle of Armageddon, where he's fighting in the forces of darkness against the forces of light. But much like many of us do know, he's one of many that do perish in this battle. So Havoc's appearance in the original timeline is short but sweet. But what of the reboot? Well in the rebooted timeline, Havoc himself doesn't make a physical appearance in the games, not appearing in Mortal Kombat 9, X or 11. However, he does play a key role in the Mortal Kombat X comic book series. Now I do wish to point this out, that whilst the games never truly acknowledge the events of the comics, it has been confirmed that it is indeed canon to the timeline, and it's here where Havoc does play his hand. During the Mortal Kombat X comic book series, Havoc does make a triumphant return. Although not too much has seemingly changed about the character, he's still very much so an opportunist, and will do whatever he can in order to obtain power. Something that we do see here. Now Havoc is somewhat front and centre during the comic book run, being the centrepiece of all that transpires with the Kami Dogu dagger. Unlike the original continuity, where the Kami Dogus were amulet, the Kami Dogus in this continuity are in fact magical daggers, that are tainted by the blood of the one being, having been used to cut him and separate his consciousness amongst the realm. Each of these Kami Dogus had been tainted by blood magic, and thus is something that becomes extremely important in the comic book run, because after Shinnok's plan to corrupt the Jinsei chamber failed, his servant Quan Chi explored every single possibility he could in order to bring him back. And one of these options was of course blood magic. Now on the run and understandably wanting to stay out the public eye, Quan Chi would reach out to the Chaos Cleric and strike a deal with him, saying he would grant him the ability to manipulate blood magic to his will if he in turn was able to obtain Shinnok's amulet. Now realising the opportunity that presented itself before him, Havoc would accept this deal, but he knew that he wanted the amulet for himself. So behind Quan Chi's back, he'd begin to play his hand, watching the deck unfold as he started started to manipulate people through the temptation and power of these Kami Dogu daggers. Now in order to do this, he needed a pawn on the table in order to take everyone's eyes off him. And this is where Reiko comes into play. After Shao's defeat at the end of MK9, Reiko had somewhat lost purpose in the world as he idolised the Emperor and wished to have followed in his footsteps. But with Melina now in control, outworld in a civil war and his master gone, he lost all purpose in life, that is up until he was approached by Havoc, offering him the opportunity to be something more, that's being a blood god. He would taint Reiko with the blood code, somewhat reawakening him and open his eyes to a form of power that he could obtain. So from this point onwards, the two would work together with the plan and idea that Havoc wanted Reiko to transcend to godhood through the use of the Kami Dogu dagger. But of course this was all part of a far more nefarious plan, something that we will indeed see later. Now Havoc would have Reiko be planted in Melina's army, so he could manipulate her and her forces, with no one asking questions. The plan that Reiko was given was to push Kotal to a breaking point, where he had to rely on the Kami Dogu dagger in order to protect his realm, and that is bait that Kotal took, taking on the likes of Goro whilst under the influence of the Blood Coat. Now whilst this was going on, Havoc turned his sights to the Shira Ryu, because whilst the Shira Ryu were getting back on their feet, a dagger had been given to them by Raiden, as he needed someone reliable that he knew could protect it. But during one horrible night, Havoc would use the blood code to influence a fighter by the name of Forest Fox and have him go on a massacre, killing almost everyone, with the only survivors being Takeda Takahashi and Hanzo Hisashi. Now while Sub-Zero was on the run from the Cyber Link Quay, he had the Kami Dogu dagger in his possession as he was given the mission of obtaining it. But with overwhelming numbers against him, he would use it in order to fight back. So another does fall to the blood code and even Raiden himself 
himself very quickly follows suit, learning that apparently a demon was possessing and killing people across the realm. He believed that the only way of getting answers was by using the daggers himself. So everything was falling into place for Havoc's grand plan. And as Outworld was in ruins and chaos, it's here where Havoc really does make his presence known. No longer wishing to lurk in the shadows, he would have a direct confrontation with Takeda and Hanzo, revealing his identity to the pair of them. As you see, Scorpion had sparked his interest. Impressed by his ability to still tap into Hellfire, Havoc believed that by restraining Takeda, he could possibly pull Scorpion out of Hanzo and have him become his servant. But during this bloody and brutal battle, Hanzo would simply not give in and would instead succumb to his wounds, not wanting to give Havoc what he wanted. Now, although the Chaos Cleric was disappointed, he was able to walk away with the Kami Dogus that he had been searching for, and thus when he returned back to his headquarters at Shang Tsung's island, where Reika was currently battling Outworld and the Special Forces, he would have a Blood God Raider strike everyone down and then prepare Reiko for his ascension to Godhood. Upon stabbing him with the Kami Dogu dagger and tainting him with the power of the Blood Coat, Reiko had finally transcended the mortal plane. He obtained a form of power that he could not believe, and whilst he was in this form, he fed on the armies of Outworld and Earthrealm. But even upon consuming hundreds, if not so thousands, he found himself hungry and in a deep form of pain. It's here where he turned his sights on Havoc and realised that something was horribly wrong, as his body was tearing itself apart from the inside. So it's here where Havoc reveals his true nature and plan. Whilst he planned for Reiko to become this, and didn't necessarily lie, this wasn't his end game. He needed Reiko to transcend to Godhood in order to become a vessel and catalyst for Shinnok's amulet. So the Chaos Cleric would crush Reiko's head and finally obtain the amulet. And as I mentioned at the very start, he would turn his back on Quan Chi, wanting to use it as a weapon to conquer all of the realms himself, not to give it to some mere puppet of Shinnok. Havoc somewhat won. With Shinnok's amulet in his possession and the best fighters of Earthrealm and Outworld under his influence, the realms were his for the taking. That is, until he is attacked by Takeda Takahashi. Infused with the power of the Jinsei, he would take Havoc on with Outworld's forces by his side. And they were turning the tide, but ultimately the blood code proved to be far too strong. And as Havoc was striking down Takeda, Havoc would suddenly be decapitated, as it seemed like Hanzo had returned from the dead, this time under the Scorpion persona. So after severing Havoc's head, he would travel to the Nether Realm and toss the decapitated head at the feet of Quan Chi. Now Quan Chi does express his disappointment in Havoc, but Havoc laughs in his face and mocks him, telling him that all will kneel to chaos and that it is only a matter of time. But it is here where Havoc has his head stamped on and is apparently killed. But this actually isn't the end of Havoc. You see, whilst he was a severed head and it was turned to pretty much silly putty, the writer of the comic book, Sean Kiddleston, has in fact confirmed that he isn't dead. Far from it. Due to the nature of the Chaos Realm, they are immortal. So even with the head splattered and gone, he could regenerate and be reborn. So whilst Havoc may be somewhat gone for the time being, it's not to say that he can't come back in future installments. And with Shang Tsung's ending, referencing both the Order and Chaos Realm, there's always the possibility that he could return as part of a story DLC pack, or maybe in a future game. We just don't know right now. But with the possibility of continued support for Mortal Kombat 11, it is indeed possible that he could return in the current installment. But until then, this has been it for the history of Havoc. I hope you have enjoyed this video and learnt more by doing so. I have a lot of fun with Havoc, he's actually one of my favourite characters from the 3D era. Whilst I am pretty critical of that era of game, Havoc was one of those untouched gems that I was really happy to see be expanded on in the comic book series. In concept and idea, he's absolutely fantastic. The lore and possibility he has around him is just so rich and creative, and is something that I'd like to see be explored in the future. Unfortunately, due to the nature of how he was written in the 3D games, and how he wasn't really the main focus, his potential was definitely wasted. So it was nice to see it be acted on in one way, shape and form, and hopefully we can see something like this again in future installments. But until then, that will be it for Havoc. Now what are your thoughts on Havoc? Now what are your thoughts on Havoc and the Chaos Realm as a whole? Would you actually be interested in seeing more expanded ideas on the Chaos Realm? Or would you like to explore the other side of the coin? Please do comment down below, as I'd all love to hear what you have to say. But until then, that will be it for this video. So if possible guys, let's try getting it to about 500 likes. And please don't forget to take that bell, as it will keep you up to date of all the content I do have coming out in the future, including a video that I'm working on for next week that will be focused on Melina, discussing if whether or not she's actually a monster or simply misunderstood. So if you're a Melina fan or fan of Adenians in general, you definitely want to keep an eye out for that, as I will be exploring
exploring a lot about the character. But until then, that's it for me. So as always, please comment, like, subscribe, and share this video with everyone you know. Please take care, and I'll see you all next time.